Hi everyone, hope you all are doing well. So today we'll be starting with yet another first aid review and the topic is or the chapter that we'll be doing is the renal. So as usual, you can watch the videos along with the first aid and annotate as and when. Also while revising the videos, watch it on a 2x for a super rapid revision. If you want the PDF, you can DM me on my Insta channel, the link to which is here and also in the description. And to access the previous video, click on the link in the description box below. Right, I have included my personal notes as and when required so that it helps you to give a better correlation. Also, you can make your own notes and add in info as and when you find relevant, especially for the topics which are volatile. So before starting with this video, that is the renal part 2, you can go watch the part 1, the link to which in the description and uh, you can also access the renal part 1 video by clicking on the top left corner here. In the last video or in the part 1, we completed the renal embryology, anatomy and physiology and we ended with electrolyte disturbances. So after electrolyte disturbances, we'll talk about the acid-base physiology which is very important because one question is always asked from the acid-base disorders. Okay? So I'll give you a flowchart approach to this and you can solve any question by this flowchart. Right, but first let us uh, see what we have to deal with. So first we have metabolic acidosis right it means that there is a loss of bicarbonate basically metabolic alkalosis it is an increase in bicarbonate then respiratory acidosis is increase in carbon dioxide while respiratory alkalosis is a decrease in carbon dioxide right so for metabolic alkalosis the compensation would be respiratory and for respiratory disorders the compensation is metabolic right so metabolic acidosis is compensated by respiratory alkalosis which is decrease in co2 and again metabolic alkalosis is compensated by respiratory acidosis which is increase in co2 then respiratory acidosis is compensated by metabolic alkalosis which is increase in bicarbonate and respiratory alkalosis is compensated by metabolic acidosis which is decrease in bicarbonate right so how do you identify these disorders so first we look at the normal values for pH remember the value 7.4 for carbon dioxide, the normal value is 40 mmHg and bicarbonate, normal value is 24 milli equivalents. Right, this you need to remember. First of all, now the first step is to check the pH for any problem. The pH can be less than 7.4 or more than 7.4 if it is less than 7.4 then it is acidosis and more than 7.4 is alkalosis right very simple till here the second step is to find the primary defect what is primary defect that whether it is a metabolic cause or it is a respiratory cause Right. So for metabolic causes, you will see that suppose if the pH is decreasing, the bicarbonate is also decreasing, right? Because bicarbonate is what? Nothing. It is the ion that is res uh, responsible for causing alkalosis. So pH and bicarbonate both in the same direction. This means that it is a metabolic cause. Same for alkalosis, that is the increase in pH, the bicarbonate will also increase right vice versa is true for respiratory that the direction of ph and co2 will be in the opposite direction for example if the ph is less that is in acidosis the carbon dioxide will be more 
while in cases of alkalosis or increased pH the carbon dioxide will be less. So arrows in the same direction points towards a metabolic cause while arrows in the opposite direction uh, points out towards a respiratory cause. Right? Easy till here. So here we can see this is metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, then respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis that we study are the primary defects. After we find out the primary defect, the next thing is to find whether they are compensated events or not. In case of metabolic acidosis, the compensation is calculated by Winter's formula, right? Where you find out the expected CO2 by this formula 1.5 into bicarbonate plus 8 plus minus 2. So, for example, if the bicarbonate is 10 milliequivalents, then the expected CO2 should be um, one this, right? That is that is 23 plus minus 2 or in the range of 21 to 25. Now, suppose if in the given example or the given question it is given that the CO2 is let us say 30 mmHg that means it is more than 25 right. So it means that from 40 it has dropped down to 30. So CO2 is decreasing that is it is moving towards compensation or it is partially compensated right. While if it is between 21 to 22 it is a compensated event. And if suppose the CO2 is less than 21, then it means it is a mixed disorder or an additional defect is present, which is respiratory alkalosis. Again, if CO2 is more than 40 mmHg, then additional defect is present, which is respiratory acidosis. This is the only compensation that is usually asked for metabolic disorders and that can be solved by this formula, right? For other disorders, the compensation is usually not asked, right? But you need to know them for solving the questions that are given in the question bank. So just let us go through them quickly, right? So in cases of metabolic alkalosis, one milliequivalent 1 milli equivalent increase in bicarbonate leads to 0.7 mmHg increase in CO2, right? Uh, so let us take an example. Suppose the bicarbonate is 34 milli equivalents, right? So here the change in bicarbonates is 10 milli equivalents. How? 34 minus the normal bicarbonate that is 24 that is 10. So for 1 milli equivalent change for 1 milli equivalent the CO2 will rise by 0 0.7 therefore for 10 milli equivalents the CO2 should rise by 7 millimeters of mercury right that is the expected CO2 should be 47 mm of Hg for compensation again if the CO2 is between 40 to 47 it would be a partial compensation and a CO2 more than 47 would indicate an additional defect and similarly a CO2 less than 47 would indicate an additional defect, right? Here respiratory, sorry, less than 40. Here it would be respiratory alkalosis and here it will be respiratory acidosis, right? The compensation factor in respiratory acidosis and alkalosis depends upon whether the condition is acute or chronic, right? So here what happens is that for 10 mm increase in CO2, in acute cases the bicarbonate should increase by 1 and in chronic cases it should increase by 4. 
while in respiratory alkalosis for 10 mm decline in CO2 the bicarbonate decreases by 2 and in chronic decreases by 5. Uh, so after that the next step in case of metabolic acidosis would be to find the anion gap right anion gap is given by sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate right anion gap is basically the difference in the measured and the unmeasured ions and uh, the normal value of an ion gap is between 8 to 12 milli equivalents per deciliter. If the ion gap is more than 12, then the disorder is called as high anion gap metabolic acidosis, while if it is less than 12, then it is normal anion gap metabolic acidosis or chloride acidosis right so the examples of uh, hagma is given by the mnemonic mud piles or you can remember this gold mark whatever you find useful right so mud file stands for methanol uremia that is renal failure diabetic ketoacidosis hyperphosphatemia like rhabdomyolysis isoniazid therapy and in fact iron therapy as well lactate increase in lactate like in sepsis ethylene glycol Right, this is uh, especially in the antifreeze or the question would say something like the man drank antifreeze even propylene glycol as a matter of fact leads to hagma and S stands for salicylates that is aspirin. Right, remember in lactate uh, there are of two types type A lactic acidosis and type B lactic acidosis type A is due to increase in L lactate which is endogenous right and type B is due to increase in D lactate which is an exogenous lactic acid intake. Also one more important or an interesting fact about salicy salicylate is that the disorder related with salicylate is macra that is metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis. In cases of nagma measure the urinary anion gap given by urinary sodium min, uh, plus potassium minus urinary chloride if it is low or negative then it means that it is a GI cause while if it is high or positive it indicates a renal cause the GI causes are diarrhea or a pancreatic fistula right while the renal causes are RTA loop diuretics the mnemonic for nagma given is hard as right where h stands for hyperchloremia a is addison's disease r is the renal tubular acidosis then d diarrhea a is acetaminophen s is spironolactone and again the second S stands for saline infusion. Remember that trimethoprim also causes nagma uh, by inhibiting the aldosterone. Then after calculating an ion gap, delta gap is calculated which is nothing but is the change in an ion gap or by uh, divided by a change in a bicarbonate. So if uh, delta gap is less than 0.4 the disorder is nagma between 0.4 to 0.8 it is nagma plus hagma between 0.8 to 2 it is hagma 
and if it is more than two then it is hagma plus metabolic alkalosis right finally base deficit can be calculated by 0.4 into weight multiplied by 24 minus bicarbonate or this is delta bicarbonate right so let's go through this again quickly first is uh, first step is to check the ph right and we de determine whether the condition is acidosis and alkalosis right after that primary defect needs to be figured out whether it is a metabolic cause or a respiratory cause right in metabolic acidosis pH decrease will cause a decrease in bicarbonate while in metabolic alkalosis increase in pH causes an increase in bicarbonate for respiratory conditions a decrease in pH with an increase in CO2 means acidosis while an increase in pH and with a decrease in CO2 is alkalosis after the primary defect compensation can be seen by the winters formula which is 1.5 into bicarbonate plus 8 plus minus 2 this is for metabolic acidosis right and this is only asked in the exams next after compensation uh, you look at the anion gap to see whether it is hagma or nagma right and the normal anion gap is 8 to 12 if you know up till here then that is more than sufficient all the additional points are extra edge points for higher competitive examinations but in NEET they will ask only up till here only. Now we discussed the causes of metabolic alkalosis sorry we discussed the causes of metabolic acidosis let us quickly look at the causes of metabolic alkalosis right in metabolic alkalosis we uh, see whether urine chloride is low or it is high if the urine chloride is increased then it means that it is this disorder of the kidney and then we look whether it is saline responsive or saline unresponsive the causes for saline, uh, saline responsive metabolic alkalosis is the use of diuretics while saline unresponsive metabolic alkalosis is due to barter and jitterman right decrease in urine chloride means that it is a simple third space loss like vomiting burns dehydration etc talking about causes of respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis so the conditions of hypoventilation are usually responsible for respiratory acidosis because they will cause co2 accumulation right so the examples are chronic lung diseases opioids or there is some weakening of the respiratory muscles like in gullian barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis kyphoscoliosis or type 2 respiratory failure while the causes of respiratory alkalosis would be hyperventilation right due to increased CO2 washout leading to a decrease in CO2 the causes are anxiety and panic attack where the patient hyperventilates then salicylates we studied macra uh, that is metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis other causes are pulmonary embolism and pregnancy right this question was asked this year that the primary disorder in pregnancy is respiratory alkalosis now look at this graph this question was asked in AIMS like they had marked a region and they asked what is the metabolic abnormality given here so to solve these graphs you should do the basics look at the y-axis so this is bicarbonate uh, the x-axis shows pH so first at 7.4 pH is normal and at 24 milli equivalents the bicarbonate is normal right if the pH is less than 7.4 uh, the condition is acidosis so this would be these all would be acidosis and uh, if the pH is more than 7.4 then it is alkalosis right it's very clear up till here then let's look at further conditions or further factors 
the third line that is drawn is of co2 which is 40 mm hg so that is normal right here they will show another line and this is co2 suppose 50 and here we have co2 let's say 30 right so here we can see increase co2 and here it is a decrease co2 so with the decreasing ph if the bicarbonate is also decreasing then it is metabolic acidosis while with a decreasing ph if the bicarbonate is increasing it is usually respiratory acidosis right let me rub this low ph low bicarbonate would be metabolic acidosis while low ph high bicarbonate and indeed high co2 would be respiratory acidosis again increased ph with increased bicarbonate would be metabolic alkalosis while an increased ph with a decrease in bicarbonate and even a decrease in carbon dioxide would be a respiratory alkalosis anything in between would be a mis mixed disorder right so that's your acid base physiology in a nutshell nothing can be asked beyond this and uh, i would suggest that you stop the video and pause it and just solve the questions about the acid base disorders and i'm pretty sure you'll be able to solve them easily now let's move to our second disorder that is the renal tubular acidosis so renal tubular acidosis is of three types type 1 type 2 type 4 type 1 is the distal renal tubular acidosis so here what happens is that the alpha intercalated cells are unable to secrete h plus ions due to which what happens is that there is unavailability of bicarbonate ions right so decrease in bicarbonate leads to metabolic acidosis the urine ph is more than 5.5 right and the causes can be amphotericin b toxicity important analgesic nephropathy right congenital anomalies like obstruction of urinary tract and autoimmune diseases like sle and Sjogren. it is also associated with increased calcium phosphate stones because uh, there is increased ph and uh, increased bone turnover next is proximal renal tubular acidosis right here the defect is in the proximal convoluted tubules where what happens is that there is increased excretion of bicarbonate so increased excretion means there is decreased bicarbonate in the blood hence it is again a case of metabolic acidosis the intercalated cells are normal that is they normally excrete the h plus ions but what happens is that the excretion of H plus is not significant to overcome the decrease in bicarbonate ion. Hence, there is acidosis present. So, what happens is that here, due to the secretion of H plus ions, the urine pH will be less than 5.5. One point I forgot to tell you, in cases of type 1 uh, RTA, there will be decrease in serum potassium and uh, in type 2 also, the serum potassium decreases. The causes for RTA are Fankini syndrome, which we studied earlier, right? Multiple myeloma or carbonic anhydrase deficiency. It is associated with increased risk of hypophosphatemic rickets. Basically, if you think about type 2 proxim or proximal renal tubular acidosis, then think about Fankini syndrome. Right. The next is type 4 renal tubular acidosis, which is also called as hyperkalemic tubular acidosis. Very important. Right. So here what will happen is that uh, there is either decreased aldosterone or there is aldosterone resistance. So due to this, what happens is that the potassium is increased. That is different from both these conditions. Right. In type 1, type 2, uh, there was hypokalemia, while in type 4 there is hyperkalemia and this is very important and this was asked also i think this year or previous year also what happens is that there is decreased ammonia synthesis in the p 
PCT and hence there is decreased ammonia excretion. So here the urine pH is again five, uh, less than 5.5 because or it can be variable right. The causes are decreased aldosterone production as we already studied like giving ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, heparin, cyclosporin or adrenal insufficiency right. Second can be due to resistance to aldosterone receptors like in the cases of giving potassium sparing diuretics or cotrimoxazole. Right. Remember that wherever we can see drugs, it becomes an important topic in itself. That is drugs that is usually a cause of some pathology. Right. So that was RTA 1, 2 and 3. And with this we complete the renal physiology and now we will be starting with renal pathology. So in renal pathology, first we will be covering or looking at the various casts seen in the renal disease. So what is the significance of cast if it is seen in the blood? then it indicates that the hematuria or the pyuria is of a glomerular or a tubular origin. For example, in cases of bladder cancer and kidney stones also, we see hematuria but here there will be no cast. Similarly, in case of acute cystitis, there would be pyuria again but there would not be any caste present, right? So presence of caste would shift our focus to either a glomerular or a tubular cause. So let us look at these caste one by one. First is the RBC caste, right? So RBC caste would be seen in glomerular nephritis and hypertensive emergency. Then next we have the WBC caste. It will be seen in tubular interstitial inflammation acute pyelonephritis right and even in transplant rejection cases next is the granular cast which is seen with acute tubular necrosis it may have a muddy brown appearance right finally in nephrotic syndrome we see the fat casts which is also known as oval fat bodies and they have a characteristic appearance called the Maltese cross appearance right finally the most common cast is the hyaline cast it is a non-specific cast which is seen usually with dehydration exercise or diuretic therapy right so what happens is that uh, due to dehydration or loss of volume there is solidification of the tam horsefall protein right so this is secreted by the renal tubular cells why to prevent uti so that is basically a protective mechanism finally we have waxy cast which is seen in end stage renal disease or you can say chronic kidney disease right this question was asked in INICT to match the various cast with the diseases and I think waxy and granular cast WBC cast were in the option along with hyaline cast right so this is a very simple question and a very simple topic moving ahead in kidney we usually encounter disorders of three types right first it can affect the glomerulus that is the glomerular disorder second there can be tubular disorders like acute interstitial nephritis or tubular interstitial nephritis or it can be a vascular cause like renal artery stenosis so we'll be starting with the glomerular disorders Talking about the nom nomenclature of the glomerular disorders, so they can either be focal or diffuse, right? Focal means that less than 50% of the glomerulus are involved, while diffuse means more than 50% of the glomerulus or glomeruli are involved. 
right uh, for example in focal segmental glomerulosclerosis what happens is that there is involvement of only 50% of the glomerulus and even in those 50% of the glomerulus only a segment of the glomerulus is affected so that is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis while diffuse involvement or involvement of more than 50% would mean there is a diffuse proliferated glomerulonephritis now what does proliferative stands for proliferative means that there are increased cells in the glomerulus right or you can say that the glomeruli is hypercellular an example of a proliferative pathology is a membrano membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis or mpgn next we have membranous so what does membranous means that there is thickening of the glomerular basement membrane and the example is membranous nephropathy right also the glomerular diseases can be classified as primary glomerular disorders or a secondary secondary glomerular disorder the primary disease of the kidney are due to then any intrinsic problem within the kidney itself like in case of minimal change disease while the secondary disorder is usually due to a systemic disease or another organ system that has an impact impact on the glomeruli as in case of sle and diabetes right now let us look at the glomerular disease in a bit detail so the glomerular disease can either be a nephritic syndrome a nephrotic syndrome or a nephritic nephrotic overlap right in nephritic syndrome what happens is that there is inflammation of the glomerulus that leads to damage of the glomerular basement membrane and this in turn causes the loss of rbc in the urine right a very important point to remember is that they are dysmorphic rbcs and in turn it leads to hematuria so the patient presents with hematuria along with rbc cast right there would be a decrease in gfr and we studied that a decrease in gfr leads to increase in the release of renin which leads to hypertension there may be proteinuria but the proteinuria is sub nephrotic range that is it is less than 3.5 grams per day also due to decrease in gfr there may be oliguria and azotemia right so in nephritic syndrome we'll see hematuria with dysmorphic rbcs hypertension sub nephrotic proteinuria oliguria and azotemia the examples of nephrotic syndrome are post streptococcal glomerulonephritis rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis then diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis ign nephropathy or burgess disease alport and membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis coming to nephrotic syndrome so here what happens is that there is damage to the food process right due to which the kidney loses its charge barrier and due to the absence of charge barriers what happens is that protein are easily filtered through the glomerulus and they are present in the urine leading to proteinuria here the patient presents with massive proteinuria that is it is more than 3.5 grams per day as well as there is decrease in albumin or hypoalbuminemia as it is lost in the urine right the cast is fatty cast as we already saw and this makes the urine frothy right due to the presence of lipiduria there is also loss of antithrombin 3 in the urine and hence it leads to a hypercoagulable state while loss of igg in the urine increases the risk of infections the examples of nephrotic syndrome are minimal change disease focal segmental glomerulosclerosis membranous nephropathy 
right? All of these can either have a primary cause or a secondary cause. Then amyloidosis and glomerulonephropathy, which are secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome, right? And nephrotic syndrome is characterized by massive proteinuria, lipiduria, fatty casts, hypercoagulable state, and increased risk of infections. Talking about the nephritic nephrotic syndrome, here what happens is that there is severe damage to the glomerular basement membrane. Right? So, this is the basement membrane and here it is damaged. So, what happens as a result? The RBCs are present in the urine. Also, what happens is that there is impairment of the charge barrier. So, here there will be hematuria as in the nephritic syndrome as well as proteinuria that was seen in nephrotic syndrome, right? So, here the proteinuria is more than 3.5 gram per day along with hematuria, hence it is called as a nephritic nephrotic syndrome, right? Nephritic nephrotic syndrome can occur with any form of, form of nephritic syndrome, but it is most commonly seen with diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. So now let us talk about the nephritic syndrome. The first disorder is acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So it is most commonly seen in children and it happens 2 to 4 weeks after group A streptococcal infection. Right? Therefore, it is called as a post-pharyngitic infection, right? The infection can either occur in the phary uh, pharynx or in the skin. As it occurs after the infection, the second name for PSGN is PIGN, that is post-infectious glomerulonephritis. In children, it resolves spontaneously, but in adults, it may also lead to renal insufficiency. It is an example of a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction and the patient presents with periorbital edema as well as peripheral edema. The urine is colored, right? And uh, we call it the typical cola colored urine while Hypertension will also be seen. If you look at the titers, then the patient would have a positive strep titers, that is the presence of anti streptodonis B and anti DNAs B, along with a decrease in the complement levels. Why? Because they are getting consumed due to the bacterial infection. The features are on light microscopy, we can see a hypercellular glomeruli, that is an increase in the cells, right? So, here if you see the glomerulus, you can see that the cells are increased, right? The lumen that was seen in the normal picture of the glomeruli, wait, let me show it to you. Here, so this is a normal glomerulus. See how beautifully you can appreciate the lumen of the endothelial cells and the pink pink mesangial cell. While if you compare this with the glomeruli in the nephrotic syndrome, you cannot make out any lumen and it is all pink pink, right? Be, uh, why it happens is that because the cells are increased and therefore this type of a picture is called as a hypercellular glomeruli and uh, this is the light microscopy appearance seen in PSGN or PIGN. The immunofluorescence would show granular deposits of C3, right, like here. And this is called as the starry sky appearance, right? So, it is basically the granular deposition of IgG, IgM and the C3 along the GBM as well as the mesangium. If we talk about the electron microscopy picture, then there will be sub-epithelial lumpy bumpy deposits. Right. 
let us move ahead to the second disorder that is rpgn or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis it is also called as crescentic glomerulonephritis due to the deposition of or due to the formation of crescents how we will just see so as it is developing rapidly it uh, it will have a poor prognosis right due to deterioration of the renal function in these talking about the light microscopy image here we will see the presence of a crescent hence the name crescentic glomerulonephritis right now this crescent it consists of fibrin plasma protein like c3 the parietal epithelial cell of the glomerulus monocytes as well as macrophages right rpgn is of three types type 1 2 and 3 in type 1 there is linear immunofluorescence due to deposition of antibodies on the glomerular uh, basement membrane right there may be also deposition on the alveolar basement membrane so it leads to a pulmonary renal syndrome the example of type 1 rpgn is good pasture syndrome where there would be hematuria as well as hemopsis and it is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction because there is deposition of antibodies right and hence it also gives a linear immunofluorescence in type 2 there is granular immunofluorescence due to the deposition of antigen antibody complex right and the example for uh, type 2 rpgn is psgn or dpgn type 3 is also called a uh, posse immune disease and here there is no deposition of either immunoglobulin or complement it can be divided into those that are positive for c anka and those that are positive for p anka right c anka is also called as anti pr3 and this is anti mpo the example of uh, c anka is wegener's granulomatosis which is called as granulomatosis with polyangiitis while c uh, p anka positive diseases are churkstrauss that is now called as granulomatosis sorry eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis and mpa right so that's rpgn next is diffuse proliferative glomerulosclerosis so dpgn is often due to uh, sle right and here there will be wire loops on light microscopy right here you can see the wire looped capillaries so this is an example of dpgn which is usually due to sle right if you talk about immunofluorescence again there would be granular deposits due to the deposition of immune complex on electron microscopy there are sub endothelial deposits next we have iga nephropathy which is also called as burgers disease right don't confuse it with burgers disease which is uh, a peripheral vascular disease right thromboangiitis obliterans so in iga nephropathy what happens is that there is episodic hematuria this is very important right and it occurs along with a gi tract infection right because iga is secreted by the mucosal linings and it occurs within 2 days so remember that psgn was occurring 2 to 4 weeks after a uh, after the infection while iga nephropathy it develops along with the infection or at a gap of max 1 to 2 days the light microscopy shows 
proliferation of the mesangium while on immunofluorescence there would be IgA deposits again in the mesangium talking about the electron microscopy feature again the electron microscopy will shows the immune complex deposits in the mesangium right so IgA nephropathy is all in the mesangium next condition is Alport syndrome so it is basically due to defect in the alpha 5 chain of collagen type 4 right remember that if the defect is in the alpha 3 or alpha 4 chain of collagen type 4 then it is called as a thin basement uh, thin basement membrane disease which is a benign familial hematuria so what happens is that due to defect in the alpha 5 chain there is irregular thinning and thickening of the glomerular basement membrane due to which it also splits right remember that the splitting of basement membrane occurs at the lamina densa and due to this the characteristic basket weave appearance is present right it is an x linked dominant disorder this is a very important question and Alport syndrome is also associated with anterior lenticunus. Anterior lenticunus means that the lens is dislocated anteriorly, right? Remember AA. So Alport is anterior lenticunus. Then the other conditions it is associated with is retinopathy, glomerulonephritis that we already saw due to the basement membrane splitting, right? There can also be sensory neural defects. So how do you remember Alport syndrome? right in medical college we were told that the patient can't see can't pee and can't hear right you might also remember another condition with this can't see can't pee can't climb a tree that's reader's disease we'll do that when we start with the vasculitis and rheumat right so can't see can't pee can't hear is alport syndrome and here as I talked about the basket weave appearance this is seen on electron microscopy right the points that are very important is that it is an x-linked decessive disorder x-linked dominant disorder then there is a defect in alpha 4 collagen 5 leading to thinning and splitting of the basement membrane right giving a basket weave appearance and the patient can't see can't pee can't hear because there is anterior lenticonus, sensory neural hearing loss and glomerulonephritis. Next we have membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. It is a nephritic syndrome that can co-present with nephrotic uh, syndrome as well. Right. So it is of two types, type 1 and type 2. Let me write here. So type 1, it may be secondary to hepatitis B or C infection. This is very important. Or it may be idiopathic. Due to which what happens is that the immune complex get deposits in the subendothelial. And due to the again deposition of immune complex, the immunofluorescence would show granular deposits. The type 2 is associated with C3 nephritic factor. This is nothing but an IgG autoantibody that stabilizes the C3 convertase. And due to which what happens is that there is persistent complement activation finally leading to consumptive Decre uh, decline in the complement C3 hence the C3 is decreased in type 2 the deposits are intramembranous right and it is also called as a dense deposit disease in MPGN what happens is that there is increased growth of the mesangial due to the deposits and it leads to the splitting of the basement membrane right here if you can appreciate the basement membrane uh, the basement membrane is split and due to the splitting it gives the appearance of a tram track 
hence it is known as a tram track appearance right so these are all the disorders that lead to nephritic syndrome now we will look at nephrotic syndrome and the first disorder of nephrotic syndrome is the minimal change disease right so minimal change disease is the most common glomerulonephritis in children in adults the most common is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis while in elderly the most common is membranous glomerulo membranous nephropathy we will look at them one by one minimal change disease is also known as lipoid nephrosis the primary can be either idiopathic or due to infection inflammation or an immune stimuli right these are the four eyes of minimal change disease talking about the secondary causes right it can be secondary to lymphoma why because in lymphoma there is a cytokine mediated damage now the primary disease it has an ex excellent response to corticosteroids and that forms the baseline of the treatment of minimal change disease if you talk about the features of nephrotic syndrome on light microscopy there are no changes or you can say the light microscopy is normal immunofluorescence is normal or negative and only on electron microscopy we can see that there is effacement of the podocytes or the food processes so here there, uh, this is an electron microscopy picture where we can see the effacement of the podocytes like let us compare it with the normal electron microscopy picture which we saw so here you can see the food processes here are like this right on both the sides so what happens is that these get effaced or damaged in the minimal change disease let us look at the electron microscopy of mcd again here see instead of the podocytes you can see there is effacement of the food processes the next is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis right again it can be primary or secondary the secondary causes are very important to learn so first is hiv and the disease hiv causes is hiwan that is hiv associated nephropathy and remember it is a collapsing variant this is very important right other causes are sickle cell disease use of heroin right obesity interferon treatment or congenital malformations the primary disease it may progress to ckd as it has an inconsistent response with the corticosteroids the features on light microscopy are pink pink glomerulosclerosis what is important to note is that only a segment of the glomeruli is involved and less than 50% of the glomeruli are involved right so that is what is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis any pink pink deposition is glomerulosclerosis and hyalinosis if you talk about the immune fluorescence it is usually negative right but it may be positive due to focal deposits of igm or c3 electron microscopy will again show effacement of the food processes like in minimal change disease next is membranous nephropathy in membranous nephropathy again the causes are primary and secondary and uh, again the secondary causes are very important so primary can be due to antibodies to phospholipase a2 receptor while secondary can be due to drugs like nsaids and this question was asked penicillin that is a chelator or gold right even infections like hbv hcv and syphilis or conditions like sle 
and solid tumors can be secondary causes of membranous nephropathy. Again, the primary disease is not having a good response to steroids and it can progress to CKD. On light microscopy, there is diffuse capillary and the GBM thickening. So you can see the thick membrane, right? Due to the thickening of the capillaries and the basement membrane. Talk about the immunofluorescence. Uh, it is granular due to immune complex deposits and the electron microscopy shows the characteristic spike and dome appearance due to sub epithelial deposits. Talking about amyloidosis, right? Amyloidosis is very important and you should know each and every part of it. We will cover it in detail in our pathology unit. But now, now let's just focus on the manifestations in the kidney. And kidney is the most commonly involved organ in systemic amyloidosis, right? It is associated with chronic conditions like AL amyloid deposition, AA amyloid deposition, right? In prolonged dialysis on light microscopy what we'll see is that the congo red stain will show apple green bifringens under polarized light right as amyloid is deposit deposited in the mesangium next is diabetic glomerulonephropathy it is the most common cause of end-stage renal disease and uh, what happens is that due to increased blood sugar level, there will be mesangial expansion due to glycation of the tissue proteins, right? The glomerular basement membrane thickens and its permeability increases. There is also glomerular hypertrophy. Along with glomerular sclerosis which is nothing but the scarring of the glomerulus right on light microscopy it shows the characteristic eosinophilic nodular glomerulus sclerosis which are called or given the name of kimmelstein wilson lesions and along with that there is thickening of the glomerular basement membrane and the mesangium is also proliferated right you can see pink pink material that is the mesangium So that's the glomerular disease in a nutshell, right? What you need to know is that the location of the deposits in PSGN, the deposits are subepithelial, and in membranous nephropathy as well, the deposits are subepithelial. The subepithelial deposits of PSGN are called lumpy bumpy deposits, and membranous nephropathy are called spike and dome appearance, right? And these deposits, the location of the deposits are seen on electron microscopy. Then glomerulo, uh, then MPGN type 1 shows subendothelial deposits while MPGN type 2 will have intramembranous deposits and therefore it is called a dense deposit disease. Talking about the IgA nephropathy, it has deposits in the mesangium, right? And amyloid is also deposited in the mesangium. For the remaining conditions, uh, remember diffuse glomeruloproliferative nephritis is SLE that is wire loop lesions while focal segmental gl uh, glomerulosclerosis is associated with HIV that is high van and it is a collapsing variant right then special names are basket weave appearance seen in Alport syndrome and Kimmelstein Wilson lesion seen in diabetic nephropathy there are very tiny tiny small points but you go through them once or twice and you'll remember them forever right Next, we'll talk about renal stones. Right, so stones in the kidney, they can lead to severe complications like hydronephrosis, if they are causing obstruction, pyelonephritis, right, as they can serve as an idus for infection, then even acute kidney injury can also be caused. If the stone is obstructed, then it causes unilateral pain in the flanks, 
right there may as well be flank tenderness the pain is colicky and it radiates to the groins and it can also present with hematuria remember there will be no cast present in the case of renal stone right so let us look at these stones one by one first is the calcium stone right calcium stones are of two types calcium monohydrate and calcium dihydrate calcium monohydrate they have a dumbbell appearance while the calcium monohydrate uh, sorry the calcium dihydrate has an envelope appearance they are basically the crystals of calcium oxalate and they are radio opaque right that is they can be seen on x rays they are the most common stones like around 80% stones are calcium stones and calcium oxalate are more commonly seen than calcium phosphate in the kidney next is the struvite stone which is nothing but an ammonium magnesium phosphate stone it is also called as a triple stone right and a staghorn calculi why a staghorn calculi because it occupies three or more than three calices hence it appears like the horn of a stag right stag is a animal that has horns the appearance is a coffin lid appearance right and very important point to note is that it is co uh, caused by infections with urease positive organism right what are the urease positive organism you remember by the mnemonic junk pubs that is proteus urea plasma klebsiella uh, helicobacter right so on we'll do this in micro in great details so why it happens is that because these organism what they do is that they hydrolyze the urea to ammonia right and ammonia is responsible for increasing the ph of the urine for management the treatment is eradication of the underlying infection along with surgical removal of the stone next are uric acid stone they have rhomboid shape they are radiolucent stones that is very important right you can remember the radiolucent stones by the mnemonic uh, lux that is lucent so first is uric acid stone and second is xanthine stone right they are seen when the urine has low ph so for treatment you can remove them by performing alkaline 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 alkalinization of urine right also allopurinol can only be given because allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor and uh, it will decrease the formation of the uric acid next we have the cysteine stone cysteine stone is having hexagonal crystals right it is a very hard stone and it is not broken down by eswl or lithotripsy right it is seen when the ph is uh, low and we read in biochemistry that there is a disorder in which the transporter in the pct that is responsible for absorption of cysteine is damaged so it leads to cystinuria that is predisposition of the urine to formation of the cysteine stone right remember that in this condition there is also defect of other amino acids like ornithine lysine and arginine so this is remembered by the mnemonic cola that there is loss of cystine basically ornithine lysine and arginine right so the transporter is nothing but a diabasic transporter that helps in the reabsorption of these amino acids and due to its defects we can see these amino acids in the urine since cysteine is poorly soluble it leads to the formation of stone right it can also lead to a formation of staghorn calculi and for investigation the test is sodium nitroprusside test we'll study about this in biochemistry as well right for management of cysteine stones first hydration must be ensured and for stone dissolution, uh, dissolution again alkalinization of urine 
right so all the stones are usually formed in conditions of low ph of the urine the only exception to it being a stuvite stone which is seen with an alkaline urine therefore for stuvite stone the acidification of urine needs to be done and uh, we use acetohydramic acid for acidification of urine in case of a struvite stone right in case of calcium oxalate stone uh, uh, we need to do alkalinization of urine and along with it we can give potassium citrate to the patient as it will lead to the formation of calcium citrate and potassium oxalate and hence prevent the formation of stones so for management of the stones we look at the size if it is less than 5 mm mm then we just need to observe the stone because it will come out through the way of urine on its own right for fastening the expulsion the medical expulsion therapy consists of tamsulosin and sildenafil and uh, this is especially helpful when the stone has reached the ureter and you can use ultrasound follow ups to see whether the stone is shifting from its position or not for stone that is 5 to 20 mm in size the treatment of choice is extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy while if the size is more than 20 mm then the treatment of choice will be percutaneous nephrolithostomy so here what we do is that a tube is inserted into the kidney that is nephrolithostomy and the stone is removed via the means of this tube right also if extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy or eswl is contraindicated then we itself go for pcnl even if the size is less than 20 mm so what are the conditions where eswl is contraindicated first if is the patient if the patient is a child second the stone is present in the lower calyx right third if for stones more than 2 cm in size then for cysteine stones and calcium oxalate monohydrate stones because they are very hard stones and they cannot be broken down by the shock wave then if the patient has bleeding tendency in all these cases pcnl would be preferred right so that was kidney stones in brief let us move ahead to the next topic which is hydronephrosis so hydronephrosis is nothing but the distension of the renal pelvis right so here we can see in the ultrasound that this is the kidney right and these are the calyces and this is the pelvis so this black black fluid is the urine right and on ultrasound the thumb rule is that fluid appears black so you can see very well that there is increased fluid causing increased distension of the pelvis and even the calyces in such case this is what is called as hydronephrosis the common causes of hydronephrosis are urinary tract obstructions like due to renal stones or severe bph which may cause back pressure right then congenital obstruction cervical cancer or injury to the ureter other causes are retroperitoneal fibrosis right where the ivp field shows the characteristic maiden waist deformity due to the medialization of the ureters then vesicouretric reflux we saw that there was hydronephrosis one point to appreciate is that the dilation is always proximal to the ob obstruction so suppose if here is the obstruction the dilatation will be proximal to it if the obstruction is bilateral or the patient has a solitary function kidney then lab values will also show elevation of creatinine right and chronic obstruction or hydronephrosis may also lead to compression and atrophy of the renal cortex and the medulla right because you can see the fluid filled pelvis and calyces are compressing and exerting a pressure upon the cortex next topic is urinary incontinence and this is also very important because they tend to ask one question on this topic every year right before that let us look at the nerve supply of the bladder
the micturating center is present in the pons and it receives signal from the prefrontal cortex which inhibit it that is called as social inhibition right that is it prevents the micturation center to activate in cases when the person is in the public right the sympathetic supply is by d11 to l2 nerves and the sympathetic system is basically meant for storage of urine right while the parasympathetic supply is from s2 to s4 nerves and the parasympathetic system is used for uh, is basically causing the contraction of the bladder and it helps in voiding also the pudendal nerve supplies the external urethral sphincter right the external urethral sphincter is voluntary while the internal urethral sphincter is involuntary right the internal urethral sphincter is absent in females so females just have this voluntary sphincter while males will have both the external and the internal urethral sphincter now talking about the neurogenic bladder so the neurogenic bladder is divided into four classes by the lapidus classification type 1 and type 2 is painless retention of urine which is nothing but it is overflow incontinence type 1 is motor retention and type 2 is sensory retention right so here what happens is that basically there is damage to the parasympathetic system so due to damage to the parasympathetic system sympathetic system will act and there will be storage of urine right that is urinary retention type 3 is uninhibited bladder that is there is loss of social inhibition right this is type 3 it is usually seen in cases of cerebrovascular accidents parkinson's disease tumor and multiple sclerosis if there is damage anywhere between the pons and the spinal cord right it leads to the type 4 neurogenic bladder which is also called as reflux bladder and here what happens is that there is detrusor sphincter dyssynergy what it means that without the opening of the sphincter there is excessive or over contraction of the detrusor muscle or detrusor over activity finally type 5 is the atonic bladder or the autonomous bladder it occurs due to any damage to the sacral spinal cord right so what happens is that there is both sensory and motor loss and the bladder is also called as atonic bladder for management of type 4 neuro neurogenic bladder only catheterization is the option so clean intermittent catheterization needs to be done in cases of type 4 urinary bladder right so let us revise again type 1 and 2 is due to damage of the parasympathetic nervous system type 3 is due to damage of any pathway conducting between the prefrontal cortex and the pons type 4 is due to the damage between pons and the spinal cord and type 5 is the damage of the sacral spinal cord right type 3 is the unin uninhibited bladder and type 5 is the atonic bladder now we will talk about type 1 2 and 4 right type 1 and 2 being overflow incontinence and type 2 being urgency incontinence so basically this is type 4 and as we already talked that there is detrusor sphincter dyssynergy and this is what gives the appearance of a christmas tree bladder the patient due to detrusor overactivity will have problems of leak and will also 
have the urgency to void immediately therefore it is known as the urge incon incontinence right it is associated with uti and for management we can advise kegel exercises to the patient that is very helpful and it really helps in controlling the detrusor overactivity along with that bladder training can be done that the patient is asked to void on a particular time right along with it anti muscarinics can be done like uh, oxybutynin flavoxoate etc and mirabegron can be given we will read about these drugs in detail in our pharma of autonomic nervous system right next is overflow incontinence here what happens is that due to damage to the parasympathetic system there is painless retention theek hai so the person cannot void completely the or there is incomplete voiding so due to this what happens again since the urine is left in the bladder there would be leak on ultrasound these patients will show a pvr that is post void residual volume overflow incontinence is also seen with type 5 atonic bladder or autonomous bladder it is usually associated with a uh, polyuria like in diabetes then bladder outlet obstruction as in bph and spinal cord injury like in multiple sclerosis right the last type of incontinence that we'll study is stress incontinence which was asked this year in neat so here what happens is that there is incompetence of the urethral sphincter right so due to which there is leak with increased abdominal pressure like for example when the patient sneezes or laughs there would be leaking it is usually seen with obesity right pregnancy vaginal delivery and prostate surgery for such patients you can advise pelvic floor muscle strengthening exercises like kegel weight loss and even pessaries can be given next we'll talk about bladder calculi so bladder calculi are can either be primary or secondary or it can come down from the kidney that is called as a migratory calculi right the primary are seen if the urine is sterile right and especially it is seen in young patients or young males the most common type of primary bladder calculi is ammonium urate stone secondary is when the urine is infected right like in case of bladder outlet obstruction a diverticula or neurogenic bladder and here the most common stone is a uric acid stone while for migratory stone that is coming from the kidney the most common stone would be the most common stone of kidney which is the calcium oxalate stone right remember the most common stones in primary secondary and migratory so now we'll study about some inflammatory conditions first being the inflammation of the bladder which is called as cystitis right so cystitis is usually acute and what happens is that the patient will present with a suprapubic pain right that is a pain around here dysuria frequency urgency right while very important point to note that the systemic features of inflammation like fever and chills are usually not seen then the risk factor is a female sex because in females the urethra is of a shorter length than the males right it is around 4 cm in females while it is 12 cm in males other risk factors could be the presence of an indwelling catheter then diabetes mellitus and conditions causing impaired bladder emptying 
Now talking about causes, the most common cause of cystitis is E. coli. While if the person is young or is sexually active, then the most common organism changes to Staph saprophyticus. Right? And remember uh, that uh, it is responsible for causing honeymoon cystitis. Right? Because the patient is young and sexually active. The other cause can be uh, Klebsiella and Proteus. And uh, if the patient has infection with Proteus, the urine will have an ammonium spell. If you talk about the lab parameters, then on investigation we can see that the leukocyte esterase is positive and nitrates test is positive in case of infection with enterobacteriaceae family right then there is sterile pyuria it is a culture negative pyuria right for management, antibiotics are given like cortrimoxazole and nitrofurantoin. Here only let us discuss the interstitial cystitis, right? It is called as Hunter's ulcer and it is a linear ulcer found in the fundus in female patients right it is usually associated with chronic pancystitis next we are moving to pyelonephritis right as the name suggests it is the inflammation of the kidneys and it is of two types it can be acute pyelonephritis and chronic pyelonephritis right so what happens in acute pyelonephritis is that there is neutrophilic in, uh, infiltration in the renal interstitium. As we can see in the histopath that there are a lot of neutrophilic cells in the renal interstitium, right? All these cells are neutrophils. So it basically affects the cortex while there is relative sparing of the glomeruli as well as the vessels. The patient will present with fever, flank pain right especially this is described as the typical costo vertebral tenderness along with other non-specific features like nausea vomiting and even chills so the most common cause again for pyelonephritis is an infection with e coli right and e coli it has a hematogenous spread to the kidney Talking about the CT, the appearance is called striated nephrogram because you can see alternating bands of hypodense and hyperdense areas, hence they appear as striations, especially in the nephrogenic phase. The risk factors include again indwelling catheters. right urinary tract obstruction and vesicouretric reflux diabetes mellitus and pregnancy the complications of acute pyelonephritis are it can develop into chronic pyelonephritis renal papillary necrosis perinephric abscess or urosepsis right for management again we can give antibiotics and treat the patient so if the patient develops chronic pyelonephritis it usually indicates that the patient is non-compliant to the antibiotic therapy when he was suffering from acute pyelonephritis patients who have predisposing conditions like either a vesicouretric reflux or a chronically obstructive kidney stones right they are the ones that develop chronic pyelonephritis here we can see the blunting of calluses along with corticomedullary scarring.
If you look at the tubules, then the tubules will contain eosinophilic cast that resembles a thyroid tissue, right? And this is what is known as thyroidization of kidneys. There are two specific conditions xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis and emphysematous pyelonephritis. Right. So, in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis, what happens is that there are orange colored nodules in the kidney that mimic a tumor and it is characterized by widespread kidney damage due to this granulomatous tissue, right? And the granulomatous tissue again will contain foamy macrophages. The most common organism associated with it is Proteus. On CT, the appearance is caused, called as the bare paw sign, right? That the kidney appears like the paw of a bear on CT. So, this is called the bare paw sign on kidney. In emphysematous pyelonephritis, what happens is that there is air in the kidneys and it is usually caused due to organisms that produce air, right? The most common being E. coli. Such patients are usually diabetic and uh, for management, we need to admit the patient to the ward and treat them by giving antibiotics, insert a foley and diabetic control is a must, right? If the infection persists or sepsis is present, then the treatment of choice is surgical debridement. Right, so here we will see like suppose this is the kidney, there would be black black air spaces. Then other infective conditions could be uh, pyonephrosis or the abscess where the management would be insertion of a pigtail catheter. Other condition is renal carbuncle which is nothing but the abscess of the cortices or a cortical abscess. And the most common cause of any carbuncle is staph and renal carbuncle also will be caused by staph. If we talk about corticomedullary abscess, then the most common organisms becomes E. coli again. Right. So, these were the infections in brief. Now, we will move to our next topic which is acute kidney injury. Right. So, AKI is divided into three types pre-renal AKI, renal and post-renal AKI. So, let us discuss this one by one. So, the causes of pre-renal AKI is usually conditions causing hypovolumia, right, a decreased cardiac output or a decrease in the effective circulating volume like in cases of heart failure or even liver failure. Here what we will see is that there is a decrease in renal blood flow leading to a decrease in GFR. And this decrease in GFR would cause the activation of uh, JGA cells, right? That is, RAS is stimulated, hence there would be increased sodium and water retention. Talking about the urine osmolarity, right? The urine osmolarity would be high, that is more than 500 and the urine sodium is less than 20. Why? Because the renal tubules are functioning and the sodium is well absorbed by the kidneys. Similarly, if you talk about phena, that is fractional excretion of sodium, it will be less than 1%, while serum creatinine or the blood urea nitrogen is high or more than 20. In renal causes, that is called as intrinsic renal failure, there is damage to the tubules and the interstitium. Right, so there can be either acute tubular necrosis or acute interstitial nephritis. If there is damage to the glomerulus, it causes acute glomerulonephritis, while any damage to the vasculature would lead to vasculitis, malignant hypertension, and TTP Hus spectrum. 
right so here what happens is that uh, there is patchy necrosis due to which debris is formed which occlude the tubules and due to the non functioning tubules there is a decline in gfr right so here the urine osmolarity would be less while the excretion of sodium is more as the tubules are non functional so urine sodium would be more than 40 while talking about fena the fena will raise to more than 2% here the blood urea nitrogen is less than 15 in cases of post renal causes or post renal azotemia there is an obstructive pathology like stones bph cancer or congenital anomalies right so what happens is that there is bilateral outflow obstruction the urine osmolarity would again be less than 350 while the sodium and creatinine would be variable so this is very important urine sodium and fractional excretion of sodium to differentiate between the pre renal and renal causes as we discussed earlier now we will see the various causes of aki first is acute interstitial nephritis which is also called as tubular interstitial nephritis so here what happens is that there is uh, inflammation of the renal interstitium as the name suggests and the patient presents with pyuria right especially with increased eosinophils and azotemia it is usually seen with drugs like diuretics nsaids penicillin derivatives proton pump inhibitor rifampicin quinolones and sulfonamides so what happens is that these drugs they act as uh, antigenic haptens and they induce a hypersensitivity reaction leading to acute interstitial nephritis right it may be secondary to other systemic processes like an infection with mycoplasma or autoimmune disorders like sle and sjogren so it is associated with fever rash hematuria pyuria and costovertebral tenderness right if you want to remember it you can remember it by 5 p's first is p that is the use of diuretic can lead to it then pain free or the pain relievers that is nsaids is the second cause then penicillins and cephalosporins right proton pump inhibitors rifampicin and s is for sulfa drugs right these are all the drugs that are responsible for causing acute interstitial nephritis the next is acute tubular necrosis so it is the most common cause of aki in hospitalized patient in most of the cases it resolves spontaneously but it can be fatal as well especially during its oliguric phases right here there will be increased fractional excretion of sodium right because it is an intrinsic cause and if you talk about the key findings here we see these granular casts in the urine right and these casts are called as muddy brown casts so it occurs in three stages first is the presence of an inciting event then is the maintenance phase where there is oliguria and it lasts for around 1 to 3 weeks and then next is the recovery phase where there is polyuria here the blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine falls and uh, in maintenance phase there is risk of hyperkalemia while in the recovery phase there is a risk of hypokalemia the secondary causes of atn can be either ischemic causes or nephrotoxic causes right so ischemic causes like hypotension shock sepsis 
hemorrhage and heart failure so what happens is that it leads to the death of a tubular cells and these tubular cells they slough off into the tubular lumen and they form the cast here we can see in the image the pink pink tubular cells that are present in the lumen of a tubule most susceptible to damage are the pct and the thick ascending loop talking about the nephrotoxic causes so they are usually secondary to some toxic substances like amino glycosides then contrast that is the radio contrast agents lead cisplatin ethylene glycol right then crush injuries that leads to myoglobinuria this is also called as rhabdomyolysis and hemoglobinuria for nephrotoxic injury the proximal tubules are more susceptible then we will talk about necrosis so first is diffuse cortical necrosis where what happens is that there is generalized cortical infarction in both the kidneys right so it can be due to a combination of dic and a vasoconstrictic or a vasospasm it is usually associated with obstetric complications like abruptio placentae and even septic shock in renal papillary necrosis there is a sloughing of the renal papilla right here you can see in the image and on gross and it leads to gross hematuria it is usually associated with sad that is sickle cell anemia acute pyelonephritis analgesics that is nsaids and diabetes mellitus right now the consequences of renal failure is usually due to the increase in the production of ammonia as as well as the electrolyte disturbance so renal failure is of two types basically it can be an acute renal failure failure or chronic renal failure the example of acute renal failure we just did is atn while chronic could be due to some systemic disorders like hypertension or diabetes mellitus so if we talk about the staging of ckd right it is based upon the kdigo system that is first the grading is done according to the gfr grade 1 is when the gfr is more than 90 2 is 60 to 90 then 3 is between 30 to 60 4 is 15 to 30 and grade 5 is less than 15 right also the albumin albuminuria grade is taken that is a1 a2 a3 a1 is albuminuria less than 30 mg per day 2 is between 30 to 300 and 3 is more than 300 mg per day that is the nephrotic range proteinuria based upon these uh, stages we do the risk stratification of the ckd right where the risk is low moderate or high right one more important point to note is that there is increased lef- levels of fgf23 which is responsible for the excretion of phosphate right so in the early stages of ckd the phosphate levels are maintained so the consequences can be remembered by the mnemonic mad hunger right where m stands for metabolic acidosis right these are all the conditions or the consequences of renal failure like what happens due to renal failure then there is dyslipidemia and there is especially an increase in the level of triglycerides high potassium uremia right uremia means that there is an increase in serum urea it usually presents with nausea anorexia 
encephalopathy right here where the patient will have the characteristic flapping tremor or asterixis then platelet dysfunction and for management of urea hemodialysis needs to be done then sodium and water retention right growth retardation erythropoietin deficiency right because kidney is responsible for secreting it and as a consequence of which there would be anemia and finally renal osteodystrophy right so in renal osteodystrophy what happens is that there is a hypocalcemia hyperphosphatemia in the later stages because in the early stages it is usually normal then there is failure of hydroxylation of vitamin d3 right so due to all these factors what happens is that there is increased secretion of pth or parathyroid hormone and this is known as secondary hyperparathyroidism if it is not managed it leads to tertiary hyperparathyroidism right now what happens is that the calcium uh, the high phosphate combines with the calcium and it precipitates as calcium phosphate crystal which is deposited in the tissues which leads to the decrease in the serum calcium also a decrease in vitamin d3 would lead to a decreased calcium absorption hence they aggravate the hypocalcemia due to renal osteodystrophy right we can see subperiosteal bone resorption and the earliest site where it happens are the phalanges right and it specially occurs on the radial side of the distal phalanx so this is the thumb this is the index finger so here we will see subperiosteal resorption the other features are that there can be loss of lamina dura in the teeth it can be associated with brown tumors right and uh, in the skull we see the special appearance that is called as the salt and paper uh, salt and pepper appearance of the skull now we will move ahead to the next topic which is the renal cystic disorders so first we'll study the polycystic kidney diseases we already know that it is of two types first is the autosomal dominant variety and the second is the autosomal recessive variety so what happens in adpckd is that there are innumerous cysts in the cortex as well as the medulla which causes the enlargement of the kidneys right and ultimately what happens is that these cyst lead to the compression of the parenchyma and there is ultimately destruction of the parenchyma the patient will complain of flank pain hematuria hypertension urinary infections right and even progressive renal failure in 50% of the cases here what happens is that there is a mutation in pkd1 gene more than pkd2 gene also pkd1 is on chromosome 16 and pkd2 is on chromosome 4 it is also associated with very aneurysm very important this was asked mitral valve prolapse then hepatic cysts this was also asked diverticulosis and for managing such individuals we give ace inhibitors of or arb to control the hypertension right in autosomal recessive polycystic kidney diseases we can see that there is dilatation of the collecting ducts which leads to bilateral enlargement of the kidneys right and it is often seen in the infancy and this is associated with hepatic fibrosis very important right Hepa uh, autosomal recessive is associated with hepatic fibrosis while dominant is associated with just hepatic cysts here what happens is that there is significant oliguric renal failure in utero which leads to 
water sequence. If the patient survives beyond infancy, then he can suffer from systemic hypertension, renal insufficiency, portal hypertension, and hepatic fibrosis. Right. Now the next topic is renal cyst. So renal cyst can either be a simple renal cyst where it is just a cystic collection of fluid or a complex renal cyst where there are septations within the cyst, right? On ultrasound, the simple cyst appear anechoic with post-acoustic enhancement. And they are most common cyst. If you sit in an ultrasound OPD, you can see like majority of the old patients who are undergoing dialysis will have these cysts in their kidneys, right? They are incidental and usually asymptomatic. Talking about complex cyst, right here there are septations which are seen as ecogenic lines within the anechoic cysts, right? They may even have solid components on imaging. So we have a Bosnic classification for the renal cyst. Uh, Bosnic 1 is a simple renal cyst that is anechoic, right? 2 is a simple renal cyst with fine septations. Which are less numerous in size. Right? There is a special 2F where the septations are numerous. But still they are fine. So 2F means that there is a need to follow up. 3 and 4 are complex renal cysts. In 3 we will have coarse septations. Right? While in 4, there will be coarse septations as well as solid components. Right, remember the solid components are also ecogenic on ultrasound. For grade 1 and 2, you just need to observe the cyst. While in grade 3 and 4, surgical removal of the cyst needs, cyst needs to be done as there is a, an increased risk of malignancy associated with these cysts. Right. Also, one more thing that you need to know is the renal tumor angiomyolipoma is included as grade 3 Bosnia classification because it has fat densities inside it. But this is the question that was asked last year or maybe in 2020. Right. So, Bosnia classification is again very important. Right. Here, this is a simple cyst, right? It is nothing but a black, black, anechoic cystic lesion in the kidney, and you can see the post acoustic enhancement as well. Next, we are moving ahead to the renovascular diseases. So, here uh, in renal artery stenosis, that is the narrowing of the renal artery, it can be either unilateral or bilateral, right? If it happens, then it leads to a decrease in renal blood flow. Due to, uh, due to a decrease in renal blood flow, what happens is that there is an increase in the secretion of renin. Increased renin will lead to increased secretion of angiotensin. And due to angiotensin, the patient presents with hypertension. Right? This is the most common cause of secondary hypertension in adults. Most common cause of renal artery stenosis is atherosclerosis and fibromuscular displa uh, dysplasia. So, atherosclerosis is usually seen in the proximal part or you can say the proximal one third and it is usually seen in male patients who are smokers. While talking about the distal two third part that is nearer to the kidney, here usually there is fibromuscular dysplasia, right, and it is usually seen in younger female patients. In cases of unilateral RAS, uh, RAS, there is atrophy of the one kidney. So there will be a discrepancy in the size of both the kidneys and the affected kidney will show an increase in the renin, right? While the normal kidney will have a decreased renin due to compensatory mechanism. Talking about bilateral RAS, here the patient will have a sudden rise in creatinine when he is started on ACE inhibitors. Therefore, remember very importantly that a patient of bilateral renal artery stenosis, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated, right? As a matter of fact, even ARB 
and renin inhibitors are contra are uh, contraindicated in patients with bilateral renal artery stenosis so these patients usually present with severe refractory hypertension right apart from that there may be flash pulmonary edema epigastric pain and there may even be stenosis of larger vessels especially when the patient is having atherosclerosis of the vein as i told earlier on doppler these patients show parvus tardis wave form in the renal artery or the segmental artery right now that completes the benign disorders of the kidney and we will move to the neoplastic conditions in the kidney starting with the most important uh, or the most common that is the renal cell carcinoma rcc is of four types clear cell papillary chromophore and collecting duct or duct of bellini and medullary right so clear cell is the most common rcc and it also has the worst prognosis while the chromophore rbc it has the best prognosis right the clear cell on histopath shows polygonal clear cells right why they are clear because they are accum they have accumulation of glycogen and glycogen appears white or clear on the histopath on gross if you talk they are golden yellow in color right because of increased lipid and carbohydrate here right the most common site is pct for clear cell rcc and it has a tendency to invade the renal vein and even the ivc when it invades the left sided renal vein uh, renal vein it can also metastasize hematogenously to the lungs the patient will present with hematuria palpable mass and secondary polycythemia so secondary polycythemia occurs due to increase in ectopic erythropoietin secretion which is a paraneoplastic condition and the other paraneoplastic syndromes associated with it are hypercalcemia due to ptrh related peptide this is the most common paraneoplastic syndrome then increased in acth as well as increase in renin right these are remembered by the mnemonic pair p e a r that is elevation of ptrh related peptide erythropoietin acth and renin clear cell is associated with vhl mutation that is on chromosome 3 so uh we'll briefly look at its staging right it can be done by either robson stage or tnm stage but nowadays we are usually following the tnm stage t1 is tumor less than 7 cm t2 is more than 7 cm t3a is the invasion of renal vein B is invasion of IVC but below the diaphragm. C is IVC above the diaphragm, right? T4 is extension of the tumor beyond the gyrotas fascia and to ipsilateral adrenal. If the tumor goes to the contralateral adrenal, it is considered as M1 stage or metastatic stage. right if you talk about robson stage so this is robson 1 2 3 and robson 4 up till stage 1 2 and 3 we can either perform partial nephrectomy or 
total nephrectomy based upon the size right if it is less than 4 cm then partial nephrectomy while for tumors more than 4 cm total nephrectomy needs to be done while if the stage is more is 4 then the treatment of choice is radical nephrectomy along with metastatectomy in case of multiple meths cytoreductive nephrectomy needs to be done right but for unresponsive cases biopsy needs to be done again now immunotherapy can also be used and this is a favorite topic of examiners especially in INICT exams so we use ipilimumab and remember that RCC is radiotherapy and chemotherapy a resistant tumor right One more thing that I forgot to tell is that uh, in the paraneoplastic syndrome, it is associated with Stoffer's syndrome, which is the non-metastatic hepatic dysfunction. Seen with RCC, right? Also look at the CT image of RCC. It appears as a heterogeneous solid mass arising from the kidney and uh, it enhances in the arterial phase with hypodense areas in between showing areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. Right, moving ahead, the next topic is renal oncocytoma. So it is a benign epithelial tumor that arises from the collecting duct. It is a well circumscribed mass with a central scar that is called as a central stellate scar. If you talk about the histopath features, here we can see large eosinophilic cells with abundant mitochondria. Right here, you can see these cells that are pink pink, hence these are eosinophilic cells. It presents with uh, painless hematuria, flank pain and abdominal mass and its closest differential is chromophobe RBC, RCC. And the difference between the two is that on histopath the chromophobe RBC shows plant cell that is cells with the resin like nuclei. These cells are also eosinophilic but they will have a perinuclear clearing. Right and to differentiate between the two we use Hales colloidal iron where the RCC would stain blue with this stain while the chromophobe uh, while the renal oncocytoma will not stain otherwise both on imaging as well as on the histopath the renal oncocytoma and chromophobe rvcc rcc are difficult to differentiate then renal oncocytoma is associated with bird hog dupe syndrome right it is on chromosome 17 and it is usually associated with lung cysts and renal oncocytoma. It is also associated with Cowden syndrome and tuberous sclerosis. Next is nephroblastoma which is commonly called as the Wilms tumor right and it is the most common cause uh, and is the most common renal tumor in children. So it basically consists of embryonic glomerular structures, right? And it is called as a triphasic tumor because it consists of mesenchymal, blastemal and epithelial contents. 
It most commonly present as a large pal palpable unilateral flank mass and it may be associated with hematuria and hypert hypertension. Right? It is associated with a loss of WT1 and WT2 genes which is on chromosome 11 and there are several syndromes which are a part of it. Right? First is VAGR syndrome that stands for Wilms tumor, then aniridia, genitourinary malformations and range of developmental delays. Right. Second is the Denny's trash syndrome. Uh, you can remember it by DD that is first D stands for diffuse, mesangial, sclerosis. Right, that causes the early onset nephrotic syndrome and second D is dysgenesis of gonads. This leads to male pseudo-hermaphrodite. Right, and Denny's dash is associated with WT1 mutation. Third is the beckwith widman syndrome. Here there is WT2 gene mutation. And here everything is large like a large tongue that is macroglossia, large organs, organomegaly, right and hemihyperplasia. Beckwood with men has the least risk of Wilms tumor. Then the differential for Wilms tumor is a neuroblastoma which is the most common abdominal mass in the children. And to differentiate between the two, you remember that the neuroblastoma is unilateral while, sorry, the nephroblastoma is unilateral mass, right? While neuroblastoma usually crosses the midline. Also, it is associated with calcifications and it is an extra renal mass or a retroperitoneal mass while the nephroblastoma would be a renal mass and it causes this claw sign appearance in the kidney, right? Also, it rarely shows calcifications while neuroblastoma would show calcification. So, those were all the renal pathologies or the renal tumor and now we will look at the urothelial carcinoma of the bladder that is also called the transitional cell cancer. Right? It is the most common tumor of the urinary system as it can even affect the calluses, pelvis, ureter and the bladder. So here we can see the gross image of the urothelial cancer and this image was asked in 21 NEAT. While if you look at the histopath image, we can see the dysplastic urothelium with a fibrovascular core. So urothelium is basically a stratified epithelium which has umbrella shaped cells on the top right that is how you distinguish a urothelium or a transitional epithelium right so here the patient presents with painless hematuria and the hematuria is not associated with cast it is usually associated with phenacetin tobacco aromatic amines, cyclophosphamide, right and this question was asked, it is due to benzidine dyes, right. The question was not basically benzidine, they asked that benzene leads to which cancer and benzene is responsible for causing leukemias, while benzidine is an aromatic dye that is a risk factor for bladder cancer, right? They are very closely related names. So just be careful while attempting the questions. Next, we have the squamous cell cancer of bladder. It is not as much common as the transitional cell cancer. It is usually due to the chronic irritation that leads to the squamous metaplasia, Right, and due to which there may be dysplasia of the squamous cell leading to the cancer. The risk factors are very important for this. You need to know schistosoma, and schistosoma leads to calcified bladder, which is called as a fetal head bladder. Right on x ray, then chronic cystitis. 
smoking and even stones that is chronic nephrolithiasis here also the patient will present with painless hematuria but cast is not present now for management of bladder cancer right first you need to know the staging so ta is papillary t1 is invasion of lamina propria t2 is invasion invasion of muscle t3 is perivesical tissue while t4 is invasion of the organs right so depending upon the invasion of muscles it is divided into muscle non invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, tis carcinoma in situ right in muscle non invasive bladder cancer we can do turbt while for muscle invasive bladder cancer you need to do nact followed by surgery and the new adjuvant chemotherapy would include mvac that is methotrexate winblastin adriamycin and cisplatin right after the surgery the bladder is formed by ileal conduit the most common being a non continent urinary diversion right now for muscle non invasive tumor we divide it into two types low risk and high risk so low risk tumors are usually uh, the papillary tumor which is less than 3 cm in size and high risk includes papillary tumor tumors more than 3 cm size and even tis and t1 tumors so for low risk tumors we do turbt followed by giving mitomycin or adriamycin while in high risk tumors we can give intravesical bcg 2 to 4 weeks after turbt for every 6 weeks for 1 to 3 years right this treatment approach is very important and it's very easy to learn as well with this we complete our renal pathology and we will start with the next topic that is the renal pharma so in renal pharma we first talk about the diuretics right so let us look at the site of action of diuretics because this is very important and this can be asked as a question in itself right so mannitol it acts on the pct then acetazolamide it will act on the carbonic anhydrase uh, that too in the pct as well loop diuretic as the name suggest acts on the sodium potassium channel in the thick ascending loop of henle right thiazide diuretics on the act on the sodium chloride channel in the dct while the potassium sparing diuretics will act on the collecting duct so let us look at these drugs one by one first is mannitol right so what it does is that it acts on the pct it is an osmotic diuretic what it does is that it increases the tubular osmolarity right due to which there is increase in urine flow also it is responsible for decreasing the intra cerebral pressure or the intra ocular pressure right due to these condition it is used in drug overdose to increase the urine flow right and it can be used in conditions of increased icd and increased iop like in glaucoma and increased icd in head injury next diuretic is acetazolamide right it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and uh, it leads to sodium bicarbonate diuresis so what it does is that it decreases the bicarbonate stores in the body it is used for metabolic alkalosis right therefore it is used in mountain sickness or altitude sickness that is it is the drug of choice 
Why? Because it decreases the metabolic alkalosis. And this question was asked this year that what is the abnormality that would be seen in case of a patient that is going to a high altitude. So if you know that drug of choice for mountain sickness is acetazolamide, then you know that the abnormality is metabolic alkalosis. Why? Because acetabolamide, acetazolamide is responsible for decreasing the metabolic alkalosis. So the answer was uh, that which of the abnormality would not be seen and uh, one option was metabolic acidosis. It can also uh, be used to treat idiopathic intracranial hypertension that is known as benign intracranial hypertension. Right? The side effects of acetazolamide are causes type 2 RTA, right? Because that is the same site. It can lead to paresthesias, ammonium toxicity, right? And it promotes the calcium phosphate stone formation because, because it is insoluble at high pH and uh, it is responsible for increasing the pH. The side effects of mannitol, I forgot to tell. So, it causes dehydration, right? It can lead to either hyper or hyponatremia. It can cause pulmonary edema. Therefore, very important point is that mannitol is contraindicated in heart failures because it precipitates pulmonary edema. The next drug is a dupe loop diuretic and uh, the example is furosemide that is Lasix. Other examples are bumetanide and torsemide. So what it does is that it inhibits the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel and uh, it decreases the osmolarity of the medulla due to which the urine is not concentrated. Right? It is also associated with increasing prostaglandin mediated vasodilatory action on the afferent arteriole and it also increases the calcium excretion. Right? We already know that it causes hypercalciuria. So uh, what are the uses? It can be used in edematous states like heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, pulmonary edema. It can be used in hypertension and in hypercalcemia right? because it is causing increased calcium excretion. The adverse effects are very important. right? So it causes ototoxicity, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. It can cause dehydration right? because it is a diuretic. Then allergy because it is a sulfur drug. Also, it can cause alkalosis, interstitial nephritis and gout. Next is ethacrinic acid. So, this is a non-sulfate inhibitor of the sodium potassium chloride channel and it is used in patients who have allergy to the sulfur drugs. Right. The only side effects that is more in comparison to the furosemide diuretic is that it is more autotoxic. Next we have the thi thiazide diuretics. The example are chlorothalidone, metolazone and hydrochlorothiazide. Right. So, they will inhibit the sodium chloride channel in the DCT and they decrease the diluting capacity of the nephron. And one more point or the difference point from loop diuretic is that they decrease the calcium excretion. So, there will not be any hypercalciuria. They are used in hypertension, right, especially when the patient has a renal insufficiency, then the diuretic of choice is metalazone. They can be used in idiopathic hypercalciuria, right? 
then they can be used in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and even in osteoporosis adverse effects of thiazide diuretic are it causes hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis hyponatremia hyperglycemia right it can cause hyperuricemia and also sulfa allergy next we have the potassium sparing diuretics so we remember them by the mnemonic seat that is spironolactone epilirinon amyloride and triamterene so spironolactone and epilirinone right they have own at the end they what they do is that they are competitive inhibitor of the aldosterone receptor which is present in the collecting duct while triamterene and amyloride what they do is that they block the sodium channel right or the enac channel that we already read so they are used in conditions of hyperaldosteronism then if there is k plus depletion hepatic failure then ascites where spironolactone is used nephrogenic di where amyloride is used and also as anti androgen right spironolactone is an anti androgenic substance and it is used in hirsutism the side effects are it can cause hyperkalemia which can lead to arrhythmia gynecomasia that is a very important side effect and anti androgenic effect then very important point to note is that what are the electrolyte changes that occur with the diuretics so first the urine sodium chloride it increases with all the diuretics right as a result the serum sodium chloride decreases the urine uh, urine potassium increases especially with loop diuretics and the thiazide diuretics while in potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone and epilirinon amyloride and triamterene that is the seed diuretics this effect would not be seen urine calcium is increased with loop diuretics right because it causes hypercalciuria and there is a decreased paracellular reabsorption which leads to decrease in serum calcium or hypocalcemia while the urine calcium decreases with a, with the thiazide diuretics right because it increases the calcium absorption so this is very important point and it is a difference between the loop and the thiazide diuretics talking about blood ph which is very important so blood ph decrease or there is acidemia with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors because why it decreases the bicarbonate reabsorption in with potassium sparing diuretics what happens is that the blockage of aldosterone receptors would lead to decreased k plus and h plus secretion and the retention of h plus ions would again lead to acidemia while alkalemia is seen with loop diuretics and thiazides so first it causes volume contraction due to which there is activation of the ras system right and ras is responsible for the contraction alkalosis second is the k plus loss due to which there is dysfunction of the k plus h plus pump hence the h plus are unable to enter the cells which again causes alkalosis and finally what happens is is in that the low k plus states h plus is exchanged with na plus in place of 
K plus which leads to paradoxical acidemia. Right, this is very simple. So, these are all the electrolyte changes with the diuretics. Now, we will talk about our final group of drugs which is the ACE inhibitors, ARBs and the aliskirin. So, ACE inhibitors are captopril, inalapril, right, all the pril, lisinopril and ramipril. So, how they act is that they inhibit the ACE that is the angiotensin converting enzyme to do which there is a decrease in angiotensin 2 and a decrease in the GFR. Due to a decrease in the GFR, there is an increase in the renin and ACE also leads to the inactivation of bradykinin. So, with ACE inhibitors, there would be increased bradykinin levels as well and bradykinin is a potent vasodilator. So, due to loss of vasoconstriction and increase in vasodilator, it will lead to a reduction in blood pressure. Hence, the ACE inhibitors find it use, uh, finds its use in cases of hypertension, right? In heart failure, it decreases the mortality by promoting remodeling. Then, it is used in proteinuria, diabetic nephropathy. Why? Because it decreases the intraglomerular pressure and it slows the thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. Talking about the adverse effects, right, so it causes cough and angioedema due to increase in bradykinin and this was asked, a picture of angioedema was given and they had asked what is the drug responsible for it. Then it has a teratogenic effect on the fetus, it causes renal, fetal renal malformations. Then there is an increase in creatinine, right? It causes hyperkalemia and it leads to decrease in BP, hence it may cause hypotension. Also in cases of bilateral renal artery stenosis as discussed, it is contraindicated. Next we have the angiotensin 2 blockers or the ARBs. So the examples are losartan, candisartan and valsartan. Right, they, they act by selectively inhibiting the angiotensin 2 to act on the AT1 receptor. Right, they have similar effects to the angiotensin. The only added advantage is that they do not increase the bradykinin levels because ACE is still functioning and ACE would lead to a, the degradation of the bradykinin. The use are again hypertension, heart failure, proteinuria chronic kidney disease like diabetic nephropathy right especially in those cases which have intolerance to ACE receptors. The last drug is aliskyrin it is a direct renin inhibitor like as the name has the ren. So what it does is that it will again block the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Its use is again in hypertension and the adverse effects associated are hyperkalemia decreased GFR, decreased PP that may cause hypotension, angioedema, right. They are relatively contraindicated in patients on ACE inhibitors or ARBs and they are contraindicated in pregnancy. So, with this we complete the renal physiology, uh, sorry, with this we complete the renal pharmacology and uh, the entire unit on renal right if you have any doubts or queries you can dm me as usual please subscribe if you're not already subscribed like share and comment on the video till then keep aspiring and happy learning